It is exactly what it is. It's, we're learning how to be fully alive. Well, what I'd like to do is open with a word of prayer, and then I want to talk to you about the third of the three baptisms that we have been looking into. So let's bow our heads together. <coughs> Father, we are thankful, very thankful from the bottom of our hearts, very grateful also that you sent Jesus Christ into the world and through him we have salvation. We're thankful too that Holy Spirit, you were sent and that as we learn to yield, as we learn to submit to the Holy Spirit, that our lives become transformed and we see things differently. We walk with authority and we walk with power and we see the kingdom of God moving forward. God, we know that's your heart, that's your desire. It's my prayer this morning that every one of us, Lord, would walk yielded to the Holy Spirit so that we might know and taste of heaven before it even gets here. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So we started out this series by looking at himself, Jesus himself. And if you remember this little phrase that I gave to you, it was, Christ and me or Christ in me. And there's a little tiny word, and and in, but the difference between how that plays out in our lives is huge. Christ and me, all of the responsibility of my life is then upon me. Christ in me means that I'm enthroning him. He's Lord, he's Savior. And I can trust him. And as he leads, it's his responsibility then to allow my life to unfold. All I need to do is be obedient to him. Christ and me, Christ in me. We made a turn about the third message in and we began to talk about baptism. Now instead of looking at the person of Christ, we looked at the activity of Christ in the baptisms that we find in Scripture. So I said to you early on two weeks ago, I said that we were going to be looking at three baptisms in Scripture. And to most people, they go, well, wait a second, I thought there were two baptisms. No, nope, there's actually three baptisms. What I want to do this morning is talk to you about the third baptism. We talked about the first baptism, and that being the baptism of blood, because there's a baptism of blood, the baptism of water, and then the baptism of fire, all talked about in Scripture. So the baptism of blood is salvation, the salvation experience. If you remember in that conversation I had with you, we talked about blood and death being very similar in that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that covers your sin. And there's no blood except that Christ Jesus died on the cross. And we reflected back upon the, the book of John chapter 16, and I, I talked to, to you about the idea that the Holy Spirit brings conviction, conviction, and that conviction causes us to say, Holy Spirit, you're leading me to see that I'm sinful, because in John 16, about verse 8 to about verse 13, we find that the Holy Spirit by Jesus Christ is defined as the one who comes to bring conviction of sin conviction of righteousness, and conviction of judgment. So salvation is that experience when you or I, we, we realize, drawn by the Holy Spirit, we realize that we're sinful and we look around in our lives and try to identify what is going to save me. And the Spirit of God will tell you, no one can save you apart from Christ. Therefore, submit to him. And that's what repentance is all about. And we shared that verse together out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13, which is, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So here's what happens. We have the first baptism, which is the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus Christ. 
And that only happens because of what Jesus said in John 16. The Holy Spirit prompts us, pricks our conscience, and we see the need for salvation. And then last week, Elder Joe Jones came and gave a fabulous message on the importance of water baptism. It being a requirement according to scripture. So we have baptism by blood, that is we receive the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that in itself is very important. Because here's the thing. You may know all about the blood of Jesus Christ. You may even put it on a sheet and dangle it in in an end zone at a football game. And you may say, I'm fully aware of what Jesus did. But the thing I shared with you a couple weeks ago is the blood has to be what? Applied. Just like in the Old Testament, the blood had to be applied to the priest before the priest could function. The blood had to be applied to the people before the covenant was enacted by God. And the blood had to be applied to the doorposts in order for that family to know salvation. Over and over again, we see the importance of application. So here it is. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, what you're doing is you're having the blood of Jesus applied to you. It goes past your head and it gets into your life. The blood of Jesus is applied to you. You know, water baptism is the same way. You can say, I know all about baptism. I know when it started. I know all about the tub that we baptize people in. I can show you in the Bible where you're supposed to be baptized. Then I would ask you this question. Has the water been applied to you? Have you actually stepped into the water and gotten wet? See, it doesn't enact until you apply it. See, the blood of Jesus is supplied but you then have to apply it. The water is supplied. You have to enact it. You have to apply it. And I want to suggest to you, as we talk about this third baptism today, I want to say to you that it is just like the first baptism and just like the second baptism in that until it is applied. It's supplied, no doubt about it. Has it been applied in your life? So I want to take you to Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It says, and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The first thing I'd like to do today is to lay in front of you a comparison between 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, and then also right next to that put Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Because I want you to see that from a grammatical standpoint, let's get technical for just a minute. From a grammatical standpoint, the first baptism and the third baptism can't possibly be the same thing. Because that's what many people believe. They believe that, well, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is what happens when you get saved. But here we see these two events in Scripture, and the Scripture exposes them as two different things. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask you three questions. And then I'm going to read Mark 1, 7 through 8, and I'm going to ask you three questions. So here it begins. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. I'll stop right there. First question, who is baptized? Look at that. Who is being baptized? Well, the person. The person who's longing to be baptized is being baptized by someone else. So that's the answer to question number one, or that is the question. So we know here in the first baptism, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is doing the baptizing here. So we know who is baptized who is doing the baptizing, and then who is being baptized into. Who is that? That's Christ Jesus. And see, that's the picture of salvation. It's the Holy Spirit, according to John chapter 16, who draws men through conviction of sin, and when they say, yes, yes, I need a Savior, I believe in Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins, immediately that person is baptized by the Holy Spirit, in, or excuse me, by the yes, Holy Spirit into Jesus. But the third baptism is different than that. Look with me at Mark chapter 1, 7 and 8. 
After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, John says. He, who's he? Jesus. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So again, who is baptized? This is the person, either you or me or somebody else, is being baptized. Who is doing the baptizing? Jesus. And who are we baptized into? The Holy Spirit. So I want you to see this. We have two different passages of Scripture talking about baptism. One of the baptisms is the Holy Spirit baptizing a person into Jesus Christ. And the third is Jesus Christ now baptizing into the Holy Spirit. From a grammatical standpoint, they can't be the same thing. And we understand number one, we understand number two. But number three, we start to go, oh, I don't know. Uh, that's a little scary to me. I'm not sure. Uh, and we have actual denominations that have been developed just for the purpose of pushing away number three. And I want to suggest to you that you need number three. You've got to have number three in your life. It's critical. And I'll show that to you. Validate that in Scripture in just a few minutes here. But I want to go beyond that. And I want to look now, instead of looking at it from a grammatical standpoint... Let's look at it from a chronological standpoint, an order standpoint. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture uh, is centered around Pentecost when, when the Holy Spirit grabs hold of people. Peter's preaching, and, and the conviction of sin comes over the people who are listening, and they cry out, which is the greatest question for people to cry out when they're convicted of sin. What must I do? So they cry out, and listen to what Peter says in Acts 2.38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look with me at the three baptisms evident here. Number one, he says what? Repent. What is repentance? Repentance is to come into alignment with God, to, to see his idea, see his thoughts, see his command, and then to do it. That's what repentance is. I release myself and I put him on the throne. That's repentance. And then the second thing is be baptized. Baptism, water baptism, is an outward expression of an inward condition, an inward decision. So we see baptism number one and baptism number two. Now let me read this again to you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And, and, you get it? And, what is and? In addition to, in addition to these things, what does it say? That's right. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a command here. A command to receive. You will receive. Now, people can put things in front of you, but that doesn't mean you receive them, does it? You can have something supplied to you, but that doesn't mean that you apply it. My goal this morning is that you would see the necessity of applying the Holy Spirit in the same way that the blood was applied to you, in the same way that the water was applied to you, my friend, fire would be applied to you. Fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. Why, Pastor? Why are we even going down this path? You're scaring me. You're turning Pentecostal. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. What I am doing, revival's coming to our world. You hear me say that over and over and over again. Revival is coming to our world. But it will be those who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who live a different life, that the world will see. Therefore, as Joel prophesied that in those last days, my spirit will be poured out upon People who walk by the Spirit are those who know they walk by the Spirit. Oh, I didn't know the Spirit was in me. I didn't. See, that's, that's, how, that's how many of us live. We, we say, okay, well, I've got Jesus. 
and I have water baptism, I'm good. But we have to reconcile and, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's important for us to understand that we don't have the luxury of determining God's box. We don't have the luxury of saying to God, God, I'm good with this and this, but this, it's scary to me. Listen, God is scary. The Father in heaven, he is awesome and destructive and kind and gentle. He is, he is loud and, and there's thunder and lightning, but he touches with softness and tenderness. How do we as human beings grapple with that? How do we understand? How do we approach him as awesome, terrifying father? There's only one way. And that's the Holy Spirit. See, he's the bridge. He's the bridge. He's the gap. And if you're not aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what today is all about. You becoming aware, constantly aware. You're thinking, is it even possible to be constantly aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it is. It's a promise in Scripture. And it's the verse I'm going to end with in a little bit. <laughs> Do you walk with a constant awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? That doesn't mean that you're not saved. It just simply may mean that you've never yielded, enthroned the Holy Spirit to say, Holy Spirit, you have the authority in my life. I yield to you. That's what baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because when you were saved, you accepted Christ into your life and the Holy Spirit came to indwell you. But that does not mean that you have enthroned him in your life. And nor does it mean that you listen to him at all. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is the awareness of the Holy Spirit. And then you beginning to walk out your life in that way. And it's beautiful. So, so here's, here's what I would like to do. I want to share with you five places that I would like to go if I had time. But I'm not going to go this morning. Uh, I want to... And I want to encourage you to write these down, study them for yourself. And here's, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to validate for you that there's this third baptism that we need to take account of in our lives. Here's, here's number one. I would like to show you, if I had time, that the baptism in the Holy Spirit, not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, we, we use those like they're the same thing. They're not the same thing at all. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, in other words, the baptism that comes from the Holy Spirit is the first baptism. That's salvation. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is when you are convicted of your sin and the Holy Spirit leads you to a encounter with Jesus Christ and you accept him as your savior. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is when Jesus Christ baptizes you into the Holy Spirit and you become aware of the Holy Spirit's presence constantly. And the scripture will support that in just a minute. I'll read to that to you out of Romans. But see, in the gospels you have the baptism in the Holy Spirit recorded in all four of the Gospels. Very few things are recorded in all four Gospels. I would suggest to you those that are incredibly important for you to know and to understand. And chances are you probably already do. The second thing I would talk to you in more detail about is the fact that we have Jesus Christ. Let me read this verse to you, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water... At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting or landing on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen, if it's important enough for Jesus Christ to be water baptized and then to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in order for him to accomplish all that the Father wanted him to accomplish, let me ask you, is it then important for you to be physically water baptized and also baptized in the Holy Spirit? I hope you nod your head yes. It's critical. 
It was critical in the ministry of Jesus Christ, and it's critical in your life, no matter what you do, where you go. It's critical. You must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If I had time, I would also tell you that, that Jesus, in the last words that he had with the disciples, he encouraged them. Listen to what he said in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In another part it says you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So you understand that, that Jesus is offering a command here. He's offering, wait, this is something that's for you. Acts is full of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I would convey to you, some would suggest that, well, that was just for the 120. You know, the, the, the Pentecost, when they were in that upper room, and the Spirit came upon them, they had flames on the top of their head, and they started speaking in tongues. That was then, this is now. But listen, listen to what Peter said about that baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because Peter spoke, as I shared earlier, he, he gave the three baptisms in one verse, Acts 2.38. Repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. It's all right there. But listen to what he says in verse number 39. This is beautiful. The promise... The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So I want to ask you a question. How many of you in here would say, Pastor David Spiker, I have had the blood of Jesus Christ applied to my life and I'm a believer in Jesus. Just lift up your hand. That's a beautiful thing. How many of you would say, you know, I have also experienced water baptism. I operated in obedience to the word and I went under the water and somebody lifted me out of the water and it was a declaration of a changed life. How many of you would say, yep, Pastor David, I've done that. Praise God, look at this. Some of your hands aren't going up, so we do have time. <laughs> Let me say this. The promise... The promise is for you. That's, that's what Peter was saying. The promise is for you. You have rights to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You have rights to that because it was a promise made to you. You can claim it. Again, let me go back to this little question. Do you live with a constant awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Oh, I wish I had time this morning to tell you my personal journey of being a Christ follower prior to being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I would go days without even thinking about God. And when I started to think about God, I would go, oh, I did it wrong. I did it wrong. And then when baptism in the Holy Spirit occurred in my life, I began to see things differently. As life went on, I was increasingly aware and I could hear God speak. He would lead left, he would lead right, he would say stop, he would say go back, he would say think this, stop thinking that. But he spoke and I heard him. Do you hear God speak? I know you guys do. And anybody who's been to Fully Alive, it's one of the beautiful things of Fully Alive. You'll learn how to hear the Father speak to you. If we had time, I would go there. But ultimately, ultimately, I could share on and on. Let me, let me give you one more. Some people say, well, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was for the inauguration of the church. It was, it was very temporary. And it, it ended. Well, let me share with you scripture. I want to take you to, to uh, two passages very quickly. And then I want to ask you the ending question, which I believe will change your life. Acts chapter 8, verse number 12, happens five years after Pentecost. So if it was going to dissipate, it would have. Check out what's going on. 
Philip is in Samaria. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So we have baptism one and we have baptism two happening. So we move on to verse number 14. So Philip, he goes back and says, you wouldn't believe what just happened. He just had a very cool evangelistic moment. So he's going back and he's telling the apostles, right? And here's what happens. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful. And by the way, that's five years after Pentecost. How about, how about Acts chapter 19? 25 years after Pentecost. So you would think if it's going to dissipate, it's already dissipated. But check out what's going on here. And by the way, this is Paul. He's going into Ephesus. And let me just remind you about the Apostle Paul. He wrote over a third of the New Testament. He's the greatest apostle that ever lived. Most educated and intelligent of the apostles. The Bible says that he even, he even ascended to the third heaven. He went into heaven. He didn't even know if he was in body or in spirit. But he saw things in heaven. And the God said, yeah, what you just saw, I, don't, I need for you not to tell anybody what you just saw. They couldn't handle it. So he got access to things that you and I don't have access to. So we find him walking into Ephesus. Acts 19.1. When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Verse 2. And he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I find that such an astonishing question. So often what I hear is, When were you baptized? So what church do you go to? He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Imagine what our community would be like if that's what we asked people. Of course, we would be freaks. But understand, I think we would get to the point much quicker, wouldn't we? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Well, I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And that's what they said. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul's astonished at this point in time. He, Paul asked, what, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, meaning they repented and they went into water baptism. Notice what happens when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. So they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. I could go on and share more to validate this third baptism in Scripture. But all of the information, there's more than enough data from Scripture that you've heard because now it becomes a matter of faith. Faith. Do you believe? Is it Christ in you or Christ and you? And now I could understand if you were to say, Pastor David, it's Christ and me, then I get why you would have a problem with the Holy Spirit being enthroned in your life. But if you're a person who says it's Christ in me, then it's mandatory that Christ be enthroned. It's mandatory that the Holy Spirit, who Christ sent as the helper and the guide, that he would be enthroned in your life. But here's the thing. It does get scary, doesn't it? Well, what's he going to do? What's going to happen to me? It's the prerogative of the Holy Spirit, not your prerogative. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit may come into you and you may start prophesying. What? The Holy Spirit may come into you and you might lay a hand on somebody and they might get healed. The Holy Spirit may come into you and you might start speaking in tongues. Are you kidding me? Nope, because that's what happened back then. Joel said, in the last days, 
God speaking, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I believe we're in the last days and I believe the spirit of God is pouring out power and authority. I believe the Father is pouring out the Holy Spirit upon people. Do you, do you walk today with the constant awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit? That's the bottom line. I'm not asking you if you accepted Jesus as your Savior. I'm not asking you if you've been, you've been water baptized. I'm asking you, do you walk with a constant awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit? If you don't, it's okay. I believe that you are about to. And that's why I'm so excited. That's why this particular message, I've been so excited. I've been waiting and waiting because so often in the local church, we sit with salvation and water baptism and we never explore because of the abuses that have been that have been taking place because of what people say and do that are outside of what Scripture says. But that's not the way God wants it. He wants it to be balanced and beautiful, but under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And the prerogative of the Holy Spirit is whatever He wants will happen, but it will all be in accordance with Scripture. So you can take heart in that. So it's scary, but it's also necessary. It's scary. When you are dunked under the water, those of you who are baptized, you release control of your physical being and somebody had their hand on top of you and they pushed you under the water. That's scary too. And when you accepted Christ as your Savior and all of your sins came flooding back to your face, that was scary too. And Jesus took him away, didn't he? Now, is it scary? Yes, it is. But I want to suggest to you, it's necessary. And that's what faith is. Faith is scary because without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. So I'm going to ask you this morning, do you want to have a constant awareness to the presence of God in your life? I told you earlier that I would give you biblical evidence that you can have that. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse number 16. You've probably heard this verse many times, but I want you now to hear it in light of the conversation that we've just had. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You've probably heard that before. What does that mean? It means on your best day, you do not have what it takes to constantly remember who you belong to, Christian. The Spirit bears witness. Himself bears witness. You can't even help him with that. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God tells you constantly, constantly, you're my child, you're my child, you're my child, you're my child. Yes, look at that. No, don't look at that. Move this way, move that way. He's constantly there for you. Are you aware? Or is it days, sometimes even weeks that go by before you're aware? You might be thinking right now, oh man, I got to clean up my life, something fierce in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No, you don't. I want to suggest to you that you take all of your junk and you set it to the side because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what to do with that and just simply enthrone him in your life. I lift the Holy Spirit up in me. Holy Spirit, you got me. I'm yours. So here's what I want to do. I'd like everybody to stand up. If you want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I just simply want you to come down and stand up front here. Just come on down. That's right. I want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's right, come on down. Don't be afraid. Press in a little bit. There's more folks coming forward. Shift a little bit this way too. Just filter on in this way. I want to be biblical in this. 
I want to be thorough as much as we can be thorough in Scripture. So keep coming. You guys are great. I want to be thorough. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the third baptism. Okay? Which in my view means, according to Scripture, number one, the first baptism has to have occurred. And that is that your heart and life have been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so if you're up front right now and you... You're not even sure whether you've ever accepted Christ as your Savior. I just want to simply ask you to do that right now. I think you've heard in the message thus far, if this is the first time that you've ever heard, you know what to do, and that is to just simply repent. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me, and you saved me from my sin. I repent. I ask you to forgive me and come into my heart. Okay? You can do that, and you can mean that. So, so if you haven't fulfilled that, I need you to. The second thing is this. I want you to be water baptized. There's a progression in Scripture. If you have not experienced water baptism, I need for you to commit to me that you're going to do that. If you'll commit to doing that, if you haven't already, just simply nod your head like this. I'm going to do that. For those people who haven't. Okay, I see that head. Anybody else? All right. I see that. Very good. And that applies to you guys out here too. All right. Thirdly, I just want to follow what the scripture says. And the scripture says that the apostles just laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask my elders, David, yep, you come on up. Uh, elders, come on up. We're going to, every single person here, we're going to lay a hand on you and we're going to pray that you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a prayer right now and then Faith is going to come back up and she's going to close out the service and we're going to continue a time of ministry down here because I want every single person, not one person to miss out because God loves you. Let's pray. Father, I'm really glad I was in your house today really glad I got to sing to you. And I'm really glad that I'm standing here with my friends who are hungry like I'm hungry. And Father, I pray that your spirit, your spirit would fill them to overflowing with a constant awareness according to the promise in Romans that says that you yourself, Holy Spirit, bear witness with our spirit that we are the child, a child of God. So we ask that that's constant, constantly led in righteousness, constantly bearing the fruit of the Spirit, constantly demonstrating the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Change our minds, change our ways that we would walk with the power and the authority of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, it's been a good day to be in your house. Thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. If you're wondering who is the Fully Alive Retreat for, it's for whosoever wants to come. It's a three-day retreat for men and women separately that you experience the freedom that Christ died to give you. John 10, 10 says that the devil comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus came so that you may have life and have it abundantly. So we go after the heart of God for you on this retreat for three days. If you are interested, please go to the welcome table. There will be somebody to take your name. And um, we've got a few for men and women coming up. And if you're visiting for the first time, we have a gift for you at the welcome table. So please go to the welcome table. Anyway, we love you all. God bless you. And have a spirit-filled day. You don't need to rush from this place. If you still want to be ministered to, um, please do.